Today on Diplomatic Ties, we shall be looking at issues concerning human rights abuses, insurgency, and uh, multidimensional global issues. Stuart Maggie is my guest on the program. He is a conflict expert and has worked in conflict regions like Syria, Kenya, Egypt, name it, helping both the military and civilians towards achieving successes in military, multidimensional armed conflicts. I believe you learn a lot on the program just after this time out. Stay with us. Welcome to Diplomatic Ties. And we're doing our best to make it as convenient and easy as possible for prospective students. So what we can do is just um, support the efforts of West African countries to, to integrate, to organize uh, a better regional, political and economic uh, integration. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Diplomatic ties, building friendship and enhancing oneness among nations. Watch Diplomatic Ties on NTA International. What brought you to Nigeria? I came to Nigeria initially to speak at uh, the Global Amnesty Watch uh, conference that took place uh, a couple of days ago uh, here in Abuja. And uh, I've been particularly interested to come myself because I come from a, uh, a part of the world. I live in e East Africa and I spend a great deal of my time uh, watching and assisting and advising and discussing what is taking place in uh, Somalia, on the borders of Somalia and Kenya, uh, in southern Ethiopia, even in South Sudan, which is slightly different from some of the issues that those countries are facing and that you are facing in the northeast. Um, but also more widely through the Middle East and elsewhere. So it's been fascinating for me to come and speak to Nigerians about issues in the, specifically for me in the Northeast uh, relating to Boko Haram and how that fits into uh, the global efforts to campaign against uh, uh, Islamic extremism. And it's been very interesting to see uh, a nation and an army that is truly on the front line of this at the moment. Um, if anyone has any doubts uh, that the Nigerian army isn't facing the, the brunt of this right now, um, then uh, I think uh, communication such as our, our, our uh, process this week, uh, events like this today, can help, uh, particularly internationally, for people to really recognize the, uh, the difficulties of campaigning in this part of the continent, the difficulties that governments face, the pressures that they are under from all around the world, not least within their own countries, to conduct a, a successful campaign uh, against an insurgent group that has taken its toll. And uh, there are a number of issues that other, <clears throat> other governments and organizations have gone through, um, some of which are slightly similar, many of which are different. You need different weapons, you need different tactics, you need a, a soldier that's trained differently you need to do a great deal so of different back things. Nigeria, what, so what, now we see the same kinds of things that the Nigerian army has had to go through. Now, of course, the Nigerian army was a much more battle-hardened army uh, before Boko Haram really became a problem uh, in the northeast. And so it was able to adjust to that uh, campaign far quicker, I think, than, for example, the, the Kenyan army or indeed uh, others in that region. Okay, before you came to do your work in mm. Nigeria, what was your impression before now? My impression was that people did not understand the scope of the campaign in northern Nigeria. People understood and possibly had heard the word Boko Haram. But among my colleagues and among uh, people who paid attention to the news but maybe didn't focus on these things specifically, you sort of had a hierarchy of violent extremists that people understood. People all knew about Al-Qaeda. They weren't quite clear about Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb, but they understood generally about Al-Qaeda. They understood or had an idea about the Taliban. They grew to understand about ISIS or ISIL or Daesh as some people call them. And some even understood the violent extremists of the Philippines. Then they may have heard of Al-Shabaab in Somalia. And then finally they may have heard of Boko Haram, up until the day the Chibok girls were taken. And when the Chibok girls were taken internationally, that changed the way that 
uh, this campaign was perceived because it brought a great deal of attention to Nigeria and to northeast Nigeria from around the world. Attention that hadn't always been there prior to that from the media. International donors, other organizations had been starting to understand the problem. But what uh, I found is that even after that, the understanding of what was taking place in Nigeria really began to fall away. People don't really understand about the work of the, uh, that the Lake Chad Basin Development Fund has done in support of the multinational uh, joint task force, for example. People don't understand the true scope uh, of Boko Haram's uh, territorial gains and the true scope of the territorial losses that have taken place since the army really kicked into gear in the northeast. Um, Today, people see Nigeria and the campaign in the north through the lens of human rights reporting, because these are the things that are in the news cycle right now. But those will move on and those will change. The only stable part in all of this is the Nigerian government and the Nigerian army's commitment to the campaign in the north. Everything else is coming and going. So now that you have this impression, mm. and uh, if you go say to some global meets, what will we be saying? What will we say? And I have a different perspective now. I will be talking about how today, if you want to understand fighting extremists, if you want to draw lessons for your own campaigns, wherever they are in the world, this is the place to come and have a look. Because the Nigerian army is, as I said at the beginning, at the forefront of this fight today. People imagine that the forefront of this fight is with the Americans, possibly with the Europeans. But for me, the fight is taking, especially on this continent, the forefront of it is, is, is in places like northeast Nigeria. And we must turn to the Nigerian army for lessons and information, and indeed to offer support. My uh, old professor of war studies has published a book recently about the future of war, and his almost last paragraph refers to the fact that we all think we know as international practitioners the direction of the future of war and conflict but most of the lessons we are really going to draw are coming today from campaigns such as Nigeria's campaign uh, against Boko Haram. It's coming from this continent. It's coming from African armies who are constrained with their funding, who are constrained by international law, who are constrained by public perceptions of them, who are constrained by the fact that they are operating inside their own country, within a legal framework, that the violent extremists are not operating within. And they are finding ways of managing that complex campaign with all of those constraints that nobody else has to do. The British don't have the same constraints when they fight in Afghanistan and Helmand. They have different constraints. But right now, if you want to look and draw lessons about how to campaign against violent extremists, especially in a, in a wide and rural setting, you must, you must come and get your experiences from the Nigerian army. Okay, the African Union Commissioner in charge of peace and security had uh, singled out Nigeria as about the only African country that successfully put <coughs> in place <coughs> a multinational joint tax force <coughs> of militaries <coughs> across uh, two yeah. countries, Cameroon, Chad, Benin Republic, Niger, yeah. to fight insurgency. Yeah. And rather than some global organizations commend the efforts of the Nigerian government and military, mm. they're trying to run it down, coming up with negative reports. Mm. What do you make of this? Well, um, I haven't read many of those negative reports, but if they exist, then I would find it a little extraordinary. The creation of a, any kind of multinational task force is an effort in and of itself, and it is one that Western countries have spent 200 years of their history putting together different alliances to deal with problems, particularly cross-border problems. Boko Haram is not just a northeast Nigeria problem. It is a problem for the region. Um, it is also a problem for other parts of Africa as well, where different violent groups link, share information, knowledge, people, equipment, funding sources, uh, smuggling routes and other things. You know, these are uh, now networks that cross many borders and they require a joint multinational response. Um, 
my uh, initial reading of the creation of the multinational joint task force was celebratory. I thought that was uh, a, a great step forward to bring together all of those uh, campaigning issues that other countries faced in order to help solve this problem that exists fundamentally in northeast Nigeria. So the global uh, amnesty watch which you represent, right? I don't represent them, but I certainly do uh, uh, talk for them today. So the focus of the paper or the talk you mm. to give in Nigeria mm. specifically was on what? It was about how people learn lessons. It was about how, le how you learn lessons from different campaigns uh, around the world. Could it be adapted for the Nigerian situation? Specifically for the Nigerian situation. How? How do you handle that? Because at the moment, armies are in a very difficult position, especially armies on this continent. They receive a great deal of outside support. That outside support comes with large numbers of dollars attached to it, but actually when you drill down to the ground, you often find that what it practically leaves is surprisingly quite small. Uh, in terms of effect on the ground. Nonetheless, it's very nice to have the support. Um, but uh, the difficulty with that support is it comes with a number of conditions and a number of constraints. Now, the other thing to consider is the support and the lessons that can be given to the Nigerian army from outsiders is all based on their campaign experience in other places. But I say to you today, if you want to know how to fight Boko Haram in northeast Nigeria, who are the people that know best? Who are the people that really understand the, the, the small unit tactics that work and don't work? Who are the people that understand the constraints of gathering information and intelligence from among the communities of the northeast and using that in their operations? Who are the people that really understand the political drivers at a very local, at a village level, let alone at a regional level? Okay. Who is it? It's the Nigerian army. The Americans can't teach you that. British can't teach you that. I'm British, but like many people in my conflict circles and indeed in academic circles, we are reassessing quite quickly the assumption that we, Westerners, British, Americans, French and others, really understand how to fight counterinsurgency wars, how to prosecute campaigns against violent extremism. People will talk of all the constraints of Afghanistan, but fundamentally, Afghanistan cannot be really considered a success. So what lessons are you going to draw from armies that spent 10 years learning their lessons in Afghanistan, uh, a campaign that can't really be described as a success? Welcome to Diplomatic Ties. And we're doing our best to make it as convenient and easy as possible for prospective students. What we can do is just um, support the efforts of West African countries to, to integrate, to organize uh, a better regional, political, and economic uh, integration. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Diplomatic Ties, building friendship and enhancing oneness among nations. Watch. Diplomatic Ties on NTA International. Back to your Nigerian situation, mm. that we have covered from your testimony, you agree with the fact that the Nigerian armed forces have covered a good mileage. Now, most of the victims mm. cap captured, uh, the ones that have repented, need to live a new life. Indeed. So, uh, what area of support do you think should be given to the North East? the affected communities so that they can come back to what they used to do before. I mean, this is the nub. This is the center of the problem. An army campaigning in northeast Nigeria is never going to fully solve the issue because to solve the issue, you need to be able to get to a political settlement for that region that can survive the withdrawal of large numbers of troops. If you withdraw your troops and everything that you've settled up there collapses, that's not a success. This is what happened in Iraq when foreign troops left. This is what happens in Afghanistan when foreign troops leave different provinces. Everything that you set up and carefully held together with 20, 30, 40, 50,000 troops 
falls apart when those troops leave. So the ultimate aim is to create enough polit of a political settlement, a stable political settlement okay. that works for northeast Nigeria, that works for the Nigerian government, so that when large numbers of troops are taken out of the region, the whole thing doesn't collapse. Okay. There are a couple of uh, intervention agencies put in pl place by the government, mm. the presidential uh, initiative for the northeast yep. and a couple. Yep. Now, with this in place, if, if it is sustained, mm. will it work? I think the way to assist it working, I can't say that it will or it won't. I wish I could, but my magic ball has failed me, <laughs> my crystal ball. But uh, the way to ensure a better chance of success is, I find, for these sorts of things, centralization is, is a real key issue here. Centralizing the knowledge and the effort in one place. And that place needs to be in the northeast. So <coughs> it's very difficult to run a truly successful military campaign from Abuja if your efforts are in the northeast. Similarly, it's very difficult to run a successful political settlement campaign to try and uh, bring, in the same way that Boko Haram did, this is what you're really trying to do. Boko Haram took over huge swathes of territory, both through fear and the, the stick, if you like, but also through the carrot. Uh, being able to offer things to people and peeling off local leaders but to now, their side. That is past now. now that is passed, but the same process can be used against them in reverse. You have the stick, that is the army, and your legal framework up in the northeast to uh, identify, to campaign against, to detain, to arrest criminals who are breaking the laws of the land. But equally, there must also be that carrot that tasty sweet that allows you to peel off local leaders. I'm talking very village level, to peel off local leaders and bring them back into the fold of the Nigerian state and away from their tendency towards support for Boko Haram. Even if they are not directly within their structures and their systems, there may be an element of support, whether it's real support or whether it's just um, mental support, you know, the idea that I, you know, I fundamentally I will talk for them, I will encourage people to go and fight for them, I'm not going to declare that I am Boko Haram, but I will encourage. It's okay. that kind of person needs to be peeled back. Okay. So what do you make of this constant deliberate move by Transparency International, mm. making negative reports about the Nigerian military, the Nigerian efforts to fight insurgency, rather than maybe encouraging mm. reports and wow. when the Nigerian government, to yeah. maybe the Minister of Information and Culture, reacts to say, this is not true, mm. it, is, it is painted as though the Nigerian government is humiliating Transparency International. What do you make of it? This is something that comes up everywhere. And the Nigerian government is in good company because across this continent, Kenya, Ethiopia, uh, Egypt, of course, um, South Africa, Everyone has had, at one time or another, a heavy-handed report from an international organization where they can't confirm the methodology of the report, they can't confirm the validity of the witness statements, they can't confirm uh, the, uh, much of the evidence that they are releasing into the public realm because they're not held to the same account as a journalist, for example. They're not held to the same account as a politician making a, uh, a question or an accusation in a committee. It's quite possible that some of these reports have some substantiation to them globally. Of course they do. Uh, these are not completely erroneous reports. And so they are, of, they are, on the one hand, a useful reminder that we are all part of a law and order framework. There is a body of law, Nigerian law, that needs to be uh, used just as it is in Abuja, in Maiduguri and elsewhere. And that is the real focus of this. It is treating people using your law. The fact that another organization uh, or a global organization or an NGO wants to write a report and use witness statements and other things to hammer away at you, fine, you can be embarrassed, you can be annoyed, you can be... <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of the day, you have your own body of law, yeah. so does it really matter? So, but since you came, have you been to the North East? 
Since I've come, no. I will be going shortly, but okay. I can't say when. So what are you going to look out for when you get to the North East? I want to talk very closely with the uh, Theatre Command uh, about some of the struggles that they are facing right now. I want to understand the way that uh, detention and rehabilitation is working. Uh, part of my background involves the disarmament, demobilization and reintegration of ex-combatants from various different conflicts around the world. So I'm particularly keen to understand the process of uh, uh, what people sometimes describe today as de-radicalization and how you take a population that has been quite heavily radicalized and uh, reduce the, uh, the overall effects of that. So that they can let's be functioning citizens. Let's speak to rehabilitation now. If you are privileged to so okay, Stuart, mm. we need to send you to not East Nigeria. Mm. Talk to those who need to be rehabilitated. Mm. What, will it, what, will it, what will you be telling them? The difficulty about rehabilitation is it comes in many forms. A lot of people simply want economic rehabilitation. They want access to good economic life, whether that is access to land to farm, or access to cattle to graze, or goats to graze, decent uh, and safe ways of uh, uh, getting access to the grazing corridors, for example, or being able to protect owners, uh, ownership of land. What you really need for a rehabilitation process is good local law and order, so that if a farmer has a problem, or if a local businessman has a problem, he's got a way of addressing it. That is going to help straight away because that allows economic life to flourish. Economic life doesn't really flourish without some kind of local justice situation okay. for contracts and other things. So okay. that really needs to be there, okay. that now, local... Now, okay. now, when the President Dispensation came on board in Nigeria, yeah. led by President Muhammad mm. Buhari, mm. it came up with three prongs, mm. security, yep. anti-corruption, yeah. and the economy. Yeah. 2015 to 2018, precisely three years, mm. precisely. Will you say they have covered a good mileage, given where they met it, security-wise? Uh, well, security-wise, I think they probably have. I think there's a great deal still to do, um, but uh, that is always the nature of these uh, kinds of presidential directives and campaigns. It's really to get people behind it and get it moving and get it going. He's identified those three issues as being key, and he's probably I'm right. I'm concerned about security now. Well, exactly. Now, within the security realm... What, what you used to know then mm. and now, do you think a good mileage has been covered? Well, I can't tell you that at the moment. I'd be perfectly honest with you because I don't have the data. Um, if you're looking at public perception, I think the perception is changing. And I think the perception is changing because you have leadership at the top that is directing this. You have a number of high-profile cases taking place to deal with corruption issues. And you have a security force that has had to react to some of these international reports about the way that they are campaigning in the North. So I think all in all, um, it's been uh, uh, probably a very difficult but progressing process. Okay. And even if, even if you see it from your seat as not very much progress has been practically made. From my seat, I see it as uh, the beginnings of a serious change in perception. Okay. Looking at it sub-regionally, mm. ECOWAS, mm. continentally, AU, mm -hmm. globally, United Nations, mm -hmm. and by extension, EU. Mm -hmm. Do you think Many organizations that have also had uh, reports written about them by human rights organizations. Yeah. So do you think they can still do more, or what do you think they have not done that they still need to do? Well, like I said, I think when you have uh, multi, multinational organizations, uh, intergovernmental organizations, they can provide a lot of support, but it comes quite constrained. You must behave the way that they behave. But more importantly, your army has to look a little bit like their army for the support to work, because that's how they like to train you. That's how like, they like to give you the support, just in the same way as they like your governments to look like their governments so that they can support more easily and talk to you more easily and incorporate you in a, in a global trade world that uh, everyone speaks the same political language, everyone has the same government mechanisms, the armies all work in the same way. Uh, that's fine. That's kind of a little bit like imperialism to me. Um, but Nigeria is Nigeria. It lives in West Africa. It's got very specific geographical constraints. It's got very specific socio-political constraints well, what, what that are quite end, different. Where the problem of uh, domesticator comes in, you have policies maybe mm -hmm. from the UN mm -hmm. or the EU mm -hmm. that you bring to Nigeria, for instance, mm -hmm. and uh, you, you are confronted with the problem of domesticating it within the system. Mm -hmm. What happens? 
in some countries, this is a real, real problem, and this is where all the heat and noise comes from in the relationships between internet and government. Yeah, you come with an assistance, and I tell you, I tell this you assistance now, is good, I, but I work very, yeah. it. I work very closely with the uh, South Sudanese government. Okay. Um, we were organising the disarmament, demobilisation of, of troops from their armies after their civil war, and uh, they were under huge pressure, not from the international community per se but from specific agencies of the UN to turn over control of their governing to the agency. Okay. And this is a big problem because this particular agency for the UN had done this in Afghanistan where there was very little functioning government at the time. So they'd taken control and they said the policies will be our policies. So how long the is funding this will be our okay. funding. Okay. And when it comes to a place like Nigeria, you can't do that. When you come to a place like South Sudan, you couldn't do that. Naturally, governing ministers will say, well, hang on, we direct the policies. And also, by the way, if you want a policy that's going to work, shouldn't you ask the people who understand the communities, who understand the difficulties and the constraints, who understand the government funding mechanisms? But there is a distrust from UN agencies in particular. It is not the same with the AU and ECOWAS, but there is a distrust among many UN agencies of handing over too much control to uh, a national government. Okay. So now that you're in Nigeria... Yes. Has your Which I'm really enjoying, by yeah. the way. Mm. Has your impressions changed about the country, given where you, you just came? My wife, who visits Nigeria often, told me I would love Nigeria. Okay. She knows me very well. She said that I would fit very nicely in Lagos, but I have not had a chance to go to Lagos yet. But my perception uh, from my visit so far is that uh, I didn't understand the depth of feeling in Nigeria about the way that the government has to campaign in the north. There is a real national sense uh, of pride in the Nigerian army, and I think Nigerian soldiers need to understand that so that their morale can maintain that maintain its high level You need that very much to be able to campaign in a difficult environment against a difficult insurgency group okay. That's been the biggest change in my perception. Okay Stuart Maggie, it's nice talking with you. Thank you very much And I believe your thoughts will go to add value to what we're doing in the country. I hope so Thanks so much on Diplomatic Task. We looked at surmounting violent extremism on the program today. I believe you enjoyed it. Always be our guest on Diplomatic Ties. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.